Welcome to STEEZ, an ongoing exploration of Gen Z's place in the financial industry. Created by Terrasheet and in partnership with Publicis Sapient. At Terrasheet, we cover the important things happening at the intersection of finance and technology. STEEZ is one of our most ambitious projects to date because it's not simply covering what's happening, but rather what's not. There's a huge gap in the industry when it comes to Gen Z. And so we've set out to determine just how big that gap is and what it's gonna take to not only include today's youth in financial services, but put them front and center as the new financial consumer. Welcome back to Steez. In our last episode, we heard from the CEOs of eToro, Tomo Credit, and Carver Federal Savings Bank about how Gen Z is changing the face of the financial industry and why that is a very, 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 very good thing because it goes hand in hand with making financial products more accessible to folks on the margins across all age groups. Now, today's episode is all about the creator economy. And even if you know nothing about the depth or the breadth of this new way of doing work um, and the gig economy at large all around it, you've definitely seen and heard of it, um, maybe by the term influencers. Uh, and if you haven't, well, it's it's about time. So <laughs> come on in. <laughs> the creator economy is, uh, you know, it's somewhat of a new world order uh, when it comes to work because creators around the world are now leveraging the power of the internet on platforms like like YouTube or Twitch or, or TikTok, to, to name a few, to, to monetize their talents and their creations while making full-time jobs and, and even careers out of it. The creator economy is, is in that sense, an important conversation to be had uh, when we're talking about capturing and retaining Gen Z. Uh, for two main reasons. First, the entire line of communication of brands with their audiences is going to have to adapt to the channels by which Gen Zers communicate, right? That's going to require working with the creator economy who are already ruling those spaces. Uh, and secondly, young people, Gen Zers in particular, are at the forefront of this economy, which means they're operating as one person businesses in the US at least. And being your own business, it's very fun. It's very empowering. It also comes with a lot of really complicated stuff, right? Uh, especially when you're young and you're inexperienced, overcoming these challenges can be very daunting, which makes it a, a pain point, which makes it an opportunity, right? So <laughs> we have with us Lumanu, um, a platform building the financial in infrastructure for that creator economy. I invited Lumanu's co-founder and CEO, Tony Tran, to talk to us and walk us through the challenges and the opportunities uh, of the creator economy, as well as some creators themselves. We have Jules Montgomery, who is the founder and CEO of Influent. Uh, she's a creator with over 300,000 followers. And Blake Michael, actor, entrepreneur, and a creator himself with over 5 million followers. So I'm excited to hear straight from the source about what Gen Z creators want, what they need, what they think about what's going on, and from Tony, who will frame it all for us in the context of financial services. So Tony, I would love to start with you for those high-level definitions and contacts. Uh, can you give us some, some basic definitions around Gen Z, around the creator economy, and, and, what, and what, what you think this all means for, for the future of work? It's a great question. Um, you know, one thing I think that's really interesting is every generation, based on a bunch of macro trends, people tend to work a little bit differently. The Gen Z generation is really the epitome of the creator economy in that it's a generation where hardware, software, you know, you can basically create great content, distribute it for free and have it seen by millions of people. And that really is what I think the creator economy is about in terms of the future of work. You know, it's an opportunity to produce really amazing content, actually have it be seen by people and then earn, you know, a little bit of money or even a lot of money doing it. And that's something that was really impossible even for millennials, right, early on when you really just had a couple of blogging platforms. And I think even just the accessibility of being able to learn the ropes without having to take long courses or, you know, um, go to college and get a degree, but, you know, still be able to make six, sometimes even seven digit figures. This idea of working from where you want, with whom you want, on what you want. And sometimes you don't even have to do it as a full-time job. You know, you can do it as a side hustle. Um, I think Adobe ran a really great study recently. There's over 86 million creators in the U.S. alone, and 22 million of them consider themselves business owners, meaning they have income and they have expenses, right? With another 44 million looking to become business owners. So really, it is sort of like the, the next generation of small business owners, if you will, is how I think about the creator economy, but a bit more creative. <laughs> I think that's a that's a perfect definition. Um, so now let's let's hear from the experts on the ground, right? The creators themselves. Jules, maybe we can start with you. 
Can you tell us a bit about uh, your journey as a creator? What attracted you to the creator economy to begin with? And 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 based on that, what would you need when when you're working with brands? I a couple of years ago was running influencer campaigns for brands, um, traditional influencer campaigns where they would sponsor individual posts. And it, I started to grow that into an agency. So decided to post on TikTok and my personal platform ended up growing and I got to experience um, the other side of things as a content creator working with brands. Um, and I realized how much time was spent doing everything but creating content, um, which is what ended up motivating me to start Influent. Um, and our goal is to help creators um, spend more time actually creating content that they want to create. Um, and I agree with Tony, what you were saying about um, the freelance economy and the way that Gen Z is treating content creation. Um, it seems like everyone is becoming a creator to a degree. Um, and I want to make it possible for uh, creators uh, to make content regardless of the size of their audience. There are so many talented creators who don't have um, big platforms. And like you said, some people are doing it full time. Some people are doing it as um, side hustle. And so I, I think that we're going to see a lot of really interesting approaches to content creation that aren't the traditional um, hashtag ad posts that we started seeing like 10 years ago. <laughs> Right. I, I, you're right. The, the, the state of the creator economy has, has certainly transformed uh, in the past few years with the oncoming of new uh, platforms. It's still very much growing into itself. Blake, maybe we can hear from you now a little bit about your story. Uh, how did your evolution as a creator take place? Uh, what were some of uh, maybe the pain points along the way? What were some of the, the platforms or even financial services that shepherded you uh, to get to, to where you are today? So back in 2009, in the very early days of YouTube, um, I had a lot of fun making videos with my friends and finding an audience online. And shortly after I started YouTube, they actually launched what's called the Partner Program, which back then was the first introduction into being able to monetize your videos. So for the first time, creators or YouTubers, as we called them back then, all over the world were, for the first time ever, being able to earn money from just posting videos and things that they love to share to the world. And it was back then when I actually realized that so many other people out there were trying to figure out how to get partnered, how to get monetized, because it was a very exclusive sort of platform and application. And so I created one of my first companies, which basically um, advocated and, and helped creators get partnered, get monetized on YouTube. And so those were sort of my, my early days and my finding of my passion for the creator economy and also helping other creators out there, which is why it's so exciting to be for the past two and a half years or so working with Lumanu and, and building what's going to be a, an amazing way for creators to manage their business. So it's um it's exciting. It's very cool to see so many new tools out there helping this very important uh, persona. And there's only going to be more and more. So uh, you know, I, I'm in firm belief that a rising tide lifts all boats. And so um, kind of spinning it back to the early YouTube days. It's now very cool to see this new creator economy being taken seriously by the mainstream, by media. Um, you know, I also believe that every brand in the future will have to become a media company, will have to become a creator in one way or another. And so this is a segment that um, desperately needs more revolutionizing, more renovating, more building. And I guess it starts with the belief by the industry as a whole in order to make that happen. Definitely. And, and, and as I mentioned in the intro, you know, this is the reason why we're even talking about the creator economy when it comes to understanding Gen Z in the financial space, because to reach Gen Z meaningfully uh, and effectively, and that's that's not, you know, de-escalating anytime soon, that's just going to become more and more relevant. Firms are absolutely going to have to understand how to successfully navigate modern channels of communication. Uh, right. It goes so far beyond your website or your customer support chat. Uh, you have to be where your customers are. So, Tony, from where you're sitting as a fintech, maybe you can tell us as a, you know, as a financial leader in the space, what do firms have to gain from working with creators? How do you think they should be going about doing business with this new class of workers um, who, in my opinion, are, are really thought leaders? 
Yeah, for sure. So I'll, I'll answer this in three parts. First is almost like a meta part, right? You know, we, we started this conversation off talking about the future of work. And I tell my employees this all the time. You know, we, we have employees, right, that we treat as W-2 employees. A lot of times, um, especially back in the old days, a lot of brands think of creators as essentially marketing expense items. Like literally on your finance statements, it falls under expenses in marketing, right? Whereas your employees fall in a different bucket. And that's the first thing that they have to change their mindset, right? Creators are essentially an extension of your team. You actually see this in other industries. You know, when a when a company hires engineers in Canada, for instance, they don't put them under expenses, right? You put them under payroll. But for some reason, when creators help your marketing team over deliver, you know, create great content, for some reason, they're considered expenses. So that's the first one, right? Just mentally put aside what your CFO wants, treat them like people, like actual colleagues and not just another expense item. The second part is um, when I think about the relationship between creators and brands, as a brand, it's helpful to bucket things into sort of these three buckets. And that helps you create those contracts in a way where it's easy to understand. It's not a whole lot of legal jargon. And um, Julie actually mentioned the first one, which is around creative production. So, you know, creators aren't just their followers and their accounts. They're actually creative producers. So the first thing is, what is the actual output you want? Put aside who they are, how many followers they have, but like, what is the actual content? Do you want images? Do you want videos? Maybe you want long form content. And there's actually a, a um, framework I tell all of our brand customers, there's such thing as pre-click content and post-click. Pre-click are things like TikTok, YouTube, et cetera. Post-click are a bit more long form, which some creators are really great at creating as well. The second bit, um, and I think the you know, NCAA sort of coined this is name image likeness. So this is where you actually think about the creator as who they are as a person. Now, you know, this is not exactly the same as followers, right? You have some famous athletes who don't have a ton of followers, but their name image likeness is worth a lot of money. So that's sort of the second bucket that you have to think about. So when you ask someone, hey, can you post that content on your Instagram profile? It's actually a combination of the first bucket, which is content production, and the second bucket, which is you're leveraging their name, image, and likeness. Um, if you're repurposing someone's face, you know, let's say, um, you know, actually one of the old ways, right, is just getting Martha Stewart's name on your product. That's sort of in a second bucket. So a lot of co-branding, like what um, Dwayne Wade did with Away back in the day, um, a lot of newer DTC brands do this as well. And then the third bucket um, is audience. This is something that I think is underappreciated sometimes, but the actual audience itself is not about follower counts, but a lot of times it's about the niche, right? And, and how hard it is to reach that audience. And this is, I think, something that creators really underestimate. You ask any marketer today with a budget and ask them, what are your top three problems? They'll tell you, I know who my customers are, but it is so hard to get in front of them because I'm competing with every single other form of entertainment, information, education. And creators have almost like a highway express lane to that audience. So as a creator yourself, right, when you think about your contract, that's how you should price and that's how you should think about it. Number one, what am I producing? Number two, how much is my name, image, and likeness worth? And number three, how much is my audience worth? And that goes beyond follower count. You know, if you happen to have an audience of all the dermatologists in the U.S. or even just 100 dermatologists, that's worth a lot of money. And just knowing your worth for each of those buckets is really helpful when you think through the contracts. That's a very insightful and it's it's a really good point, right? And it goes back to my, my earlier comment on 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 some 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 influencers, right? Some creators uh, actually being thought leaders. Uh, creators online have built audiences that are full of target audiences, uh, customers, sorry, that companies would just do a whole lot to get in front of. Um, in that sense, the best creators, you know, not everybody, but the best, are not marketing expenses, they're thought leaders, they're consultants to brands. So um, now turning this question on its head to you, Blake and Jules, uh, as creators, knowing this tremendous value that you can potentially bring to the customer acquisition and retention efforts of companies, you know, many financial companies today, they don't even have somewhat of a presence on the right platforms like, you know, like TikTok. I'm not going to call anybody out. There's just too many people to call out. It's just the whole industry is just not there. You know, it's just not where it needs to be. And we'll continue talking about this in the series. Where do you guys think that these firms should even start? What, what, what do you think are some some good practices when it comes to leveraging creators in order to assist them in getting where they need to be? I think it's a two-way street, right? So these would apply to both the brand and the creator. Um, and I kind of separate these into three different things. The first one would be open communication and, and dialogue and just 
being able to know like, Hey, it's actually good to touch base once in a while. It's good to communicate what's going on. If something's not working, that's ultimately going to lead to trust, which I think is the most important asset of the relationship. The second part is honesty and transparency. Um, It's so important when you're building the relationship um, to be candid about things, because I think that also adds to this, um, this trust factor. And the third is having a long-term mindset. A lot of brand deals are structured in a way that they're very short-term, but I find my favorite brands to work with, my favorite CMOs and influencer marketers are the ones who um, who really have the belief that, hey, this isn't going to be just a one-time thing. We're going to work together in the future for a very long time. And so thinking of these campaigns as not just a short-term item, but a long-term relationship is so important. Um, And it's really relationship-based. I think everything comes down to relationship. So when you kind of instill those, those three concepts, I think you're probably set up for success when it comes to the relationship between the brand and the creator. Yeah, for sure. So I couldn't agree more with what Blake was saying about longer term relationships with brands being the most beneficial. Um, But I'd also like to add that what we've been seeing work really well for brands recently is building their own platforms. Um, And I think that ties back into what you were saying about every brand having to become a media company. Um, I think it's never been more important for brands to have their um, have a digital presence and be able to connect with their audience on their own platform. So we're seeing more and more of brands asking for digital rights from creators and asking for specific deliverables that they can repost and use to build their own brand images. And this allows creators to work with brands in different ways, non-traditional ways, or to um, make more money off of the content that they're already creating by selling digital rights. Um, And it's also beneficial to the brands because then they can run ads with the content. They can um, build their own platforms, like actually make sure that they're building an audience on TikTok that they can come back to and continue to um, talk to. Um, So yeah, I think that um, we're going to see more and more brands working with creators to build their own platforms and brands working with creators as like collaborate like collaborators and people who are part of the team, uh, not just, again, like a once-off expense, like you were saying. I think we're going to see a lot more long-term collaboration between brands and creators. Definitely. Definitely. I'm personally very excited to see how some of the bigger names in the space that have, you know, for so many years uh, rested on the footing of, of, of legacy, so to speak, enter this new digital space with the short form videos uh, and be able to make an impact with the younger generations. I don't think we're going to see banking uh, professionals dancing on TikTok yet. Uh, obviously, it's going to be in a much more intelligent way, I hope, uh, through collaborating with with creators. Um, and so I want to bring this back to you, Tony. Now, so many Gen Zers are just stepping into the world, right? They have a beginner's knowledge, maybe, of financial management basics. For example, uh, many of them are using BNPL and credit products. Many of us are. Um, but very little of them report that they actually have a true comprehension of how these vehicles work, which is very dangerous. Um, as a fintech founder, how do you think uh, fintech companies can help close this gap in the education or should? And, and do you see the creator economy uh, playing into that mission as well? Oh, man, I have so many topics about this. Funny enough, I was um, my brother just picked me up from uh, Atlanta yesterday and we were just talking through you know, he's selling his chicken farm tomorrow and he's one generation above me and just understanding how he even got the money to buy the farm in the first place. I realized how out of water I am in terms of knowledge about financial basics. So to your point, it just feels like the, you know, financial literacy, I would say is one of the most empowering thing that a person can have, but unfortunately it's also one of the greatest driver of disparities and in, in everything. And there's a lot of sort of systematic inequalities, right? When it comes to just who knows what, and it's a compounding advantage. You know, if you know, for instance, the time value of money, um, you can really grow a lot faster than your peers. So just with that lens, um, you know, the first thing I, I want to talk about is in terms of modern fintech companies, one of the first things is just understanding the terminology that you use for folks. Um, we had a recent creator who needed a $60,000 business loan. 
they couldn't get the loan from a bank because unlike most additional W-2 employees, you know, when you buy a house or whatever, they just don't have that, right? They have a series of 1099s, no repeatable jobs. And just even a basic question of like, do you want a business loan or do you want a cash advance on your receivables? Which of course they're like, well, what's a receivable? Well, do you want a cash advance and all of your income, right? Just very basic terminology like that or invoice factoring. I think it's really helpful for um, for a lot of defense tech companies to start addressing problems, not from a matter of financial jargon, but like, okay, what do you need? Do you need cash flow? Do you want to increase your savings? Do you want to have, you know, um, a safety net in case, you know, the, the economy does something and then you go drive for a bit and just understanding what the problems are and then figuring out what the solutions are. And then from there, you know, we can back into traditional financial instruments, whether it's a business loan, whether it's, you know, invoice factoring, is it receivables financing? And I can go on and on about the technical terms, but I think just, simplifying the technical words into things that are actually useful. You know, Lumanu has this product feature called early pay. It's not groundbreaking in that the, the financial instrument doesn't exist. Like it exists for decades, right? It's called invoice factory. But you go to a creator and you tell them, you know, I have an invoice factoring product for you. They probably won't know what it is. And a lot of invoice factoring companies can be very predatory too, because it's just not built for the, you know, creator economy. So I think that's number one is just simplifying the terms down. Number two is just really knowing your audience. You know, I think for me, when I look at a lot of the um, the new fintech companies, understanding, for instance, that banking for Gen Z might not be just putting money in a savings account or checking account. You know, every generation has slightly different needs. Maybe banking in today's world is also how do, how do you make your money work for you? How do you make it grow? Whether it's through crypto, DeFi lending, you know, higher interest rate savings account, especially now, you know, the Fed's raising interest rate quite a bit. So just, you know, having fintech companies do more than just hold your money, but actually help you put that money to use in whatever way, you know, the generation needs. Certainly. Uh, you know, thank you for that answer. I, I definitely I definitely hope that the work that we're doing with Steez, uh, starting with the guide, now with the podcast, soon we're going to be doing uh, uh, an industry-wide survey that is measuring just how Gen Z ready institutions are. Really excited about that. And I think that all of this work, just kind of choosing this question and going with it um, is an effort to sort of chip away at that gap. I think a lot of understanding on how to actually provide real value is going to require conversations, which is you know what we're doing here today. So I'm gonna take advantage of, of having you Jules and Blake in the space with us. And ask you guys as you know, Gen Zers, like just like on the on the late end of Gen Z, what kind of financial education uh, and services do you wish you had earlier on? Um, maybe in what ways has the financial system served or or failed you as young folks and and specifically maybe as creators? Sure, yeah, I would say um, I knew nothing about planning for retirement or investing when I first graduated. And I think if you don't go directly into a traditional job where they hand you papers and they say, here are your options. You can, you know, we'll match your 401k contributions. If you don't have that, if you are a freelancer or a solopreneur, like so many Gen Zers are, um, you're really on your own when it comes to learning about um, financial services and planning for your future. Um, I feel like I was pretty lucky to have um, some people that I could reach out to and ask for advice and, and kind of learn from. Um, but I, I think that we definitely need to do better in terms of financial education, especially because we don't know what is going to be there to catch us when retirement time comes. Um, people are living longer. There are so many factors. Um, so I would say like, yeah, I think it's very important for creators and people in the freelance economy to, uh, have better financial education tools. I use some really traditional tools. I have like, you know, Roth IRA, like mutual funds. I don't know that kind of stuff. I also use Lumanu for my, from brand collaborations. Um, it's just like nice having everything in one place with like contracting and invoicing and all of that. Um, because that can be, uh, really messy. Um, but yeah, I think, um, worst experiences um I, I would say that like the worst part of my experience has just been like not knowing anything in the beginning um and having to figure stuff out from square one um so I think if there were if there was some kind of way to like get educated early on um and I, I don't think anything was really marketed to me I would say that I'm like a cusper um 
zillennial. Um, and I feel like when I was in college and graduating, like there was definitely just like nothing in the financial space marketed toward young people. Um, all I had access to was like anything to like my dad knew about. <laughs> no, I definitely uh, resonate with what Jules had to say. Um, you know, I was a bit of an outlier at eight years old. I was like watching stock tickers on TV and, you know, buying shares of Target instead of buying toys at Target. Um, but, you know, growing up as an actor, I definitely came across um, so many issues when it came to getting any sort of a business loan, a car loan, um, a mortgage, because they don't understand when they look at my balance sheet or my income statement, um, they don't see it the same way as, as normal businesses because my my earnings are completely irregular, right? I'm, um, I'm a contractor here and I'm working on set there and earning brand deals all over the place and it doesn't really add up for them. And that's why it's so exciting to see tools purpose built for creators really lifting up this whole industry and providing tooling to empower a whole new generation. You know, with Lumanu, it's essentially a business in a box for creators where now for the first time ever, creators have access to be able to have a transparent understanding of what's going on with all of their invoices, streamlining their payments and knowing like, hey, money's going to come in the bank um, before it's actually supposed to, you know, with early pay, you can essentially get paid up front for your work and not have to wait the net 30, 60, 90 terms. And I think tools like this are really changing the game for creators specifically. Now, in terms of um, bad experiences, you know, I was invoicing with other services who had no idea how to serve me as a creator and also um, just a terrible user experience, both with customer service and the UI. It's not built for someone like me. You know, they were asking me to punch in strings of code in this, what seems to have been an API tool or something that developers are meant to build into their websites and is now marketed towards creators in a way that I don't think is really fair for our, our audience. And so that's why it's exciting to see tools like Lumanu and so many others um, really uh, lift the tide and and help um, me and my friends out there. Wow. So, so, you know, on one end, I'm really happy to hear that you guys figured it all out. Thank you for sharing. Um, but I can't help but wonder what it's like for, for the majority of other uh, young folks out there who want to be creators. They're just getting out there. They want to build their audiences based on the things that they're passionate and knowledgeable about, who are then thrown into... Uh, as we called it, the wild, wild west <laughs> um, without much of a playbook, right? So my final my final question on this, I think, is what's next, right? Uh, so Tony, maybe you can take that. As a fintech seeking to make good on some of these pain points, right? What do you think is it going to take uh, for creators to be appreciated and served meaningfully in, in a nice symbiotic relationship with, with firms in the financial space? It's going to take an army. And that army is not just, you know, Disney stars or tech founders or, you know, agency owners, creators, it's going to take brands and agencies. It's the people that are writing the paychecks for these creators. We just have to figure out a way to recreate that same sense of caring, right? You know, when IBM cared about their employees, why can't Walmart care about their creators the same way? Why can't they also include, you know, I, I joke sometimes, but like, why can't creators just add an 8% fee on top of their contracts for basically unemployment insurance, health insurance, et cetera, right? Just like how employers have to pay, um, you know, for their own employees. Now, none of this is going to be possible overnight, but I think if enough companies, enough agencies, enough brands realize that treating creators as an extension of your, your workforce is going to generate greater work, greater impact, more authenticity, and also you're doing great good, right? Because you're helping a whole generation get better at their finance. Um, it's going to be really great. But yeah, it's going to take an army to, to impact the change that we want to see. Um, I mean, I'm hoping that we'll get there one day. Definitely. I, I certainly do too. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing the ripples of our conversations here into the future. Uh, Tony Jules and Blake, thank you guys so much for making the time to speak with us today and giving us that insider's view into the creator economy. To our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in. Episode two of Steve's very exciting. And if you think we're done talking about TikTok, I mean, we have barely just mentioned it today. Um, next episode is all about TikTok. We're going to be doing a deep dive into the world of FinTalk, financial education on TikTok, and why Gen Z is even looking for financial advice on social media of all places. Hint, it's because they're not getting it at school or from their bank. But, you know, stay tuned. <laughs>